Great Disasters and Horrors in the World's History by Alan H. Godby. Preface. Whatever be the ideas of the public upon a glance at the title page of this work, it is not intended to pander to the morbid desire for the sensational or horrible characteristic of weak minds. This volume is not a literary morgue. Mankind is constantly astonished by reports of mishaps and disasters of manifold character, when there is seldom room for astonishment. A large proportion of the calamities reported from day to day are directly due to the haste, greed, and heedlessness of man himself, and need no comment. But there is a large class of disasters due solely to meteorological or geological conditions which surpass all others in magnitude and appalling destruction. In such cases, men insist on prating about mysterious visitations, as though these occurrences were subject to the dominion of no law. To an examination of such is this book devoted. When in school, the writer was often struck by the persistence with which even the most diligent students would call upon the teachers of physics and chemistry to suspend the recitation and devote the time to illustrative experiments. Physical geography was constantly pronounced very dry because of the scarcity of opportunities for illustration. The writer has endeavored to present, in a form acceptable to the popular palate, the general principles of the storm and earthquake so far as they are understood, and numerous narratives of great disturbances have been inserted that a clearer conception of the magnitude of these agencies and their relative importance may be attained by the reader. Much care has been spent in steering between Scylla and Charybdis. While it has been designed to avoid merely scientific data, there has been the equally delicate task of avoiding prolix narration and mere sensational tales. It is hoped that the result will be useful and interesting. If the book shall lead the reader to higher views of the reign of inexorable law in nature and to a profounder reverence for the author of law and his works, the labor of its compilation will not have been spent in vain. A. H. Godby End of Preface Chapter 16 The Johnstown Flood A sullen hoarse murmur and nameless fear, a sound like the tread of a hurrying host, a roar like the storm as the wild waters near, like the dash of the sea on a crag-bordered coast. A wave like a mountain sweeps swift through the vale, ten thousand wrecked homes tossing dark in its spray. Wild cries of death, anguish echo mocks with her wail, and the fiend of the flood now has claimed his prey. India, profiting by long and sad experience, has provided, as far as may be possible, against the contingencies of drought and famine by the establishment of a magnificent system of storage reservoirs, to furnish water for irrigating when rain is wanting. Some of these tanks are fine specimens of engineering, and so far as records go, no disaster has ever attended their establishment. But to be ready and efficient, for purposes of irrigation, the water must be above the level of the surrounding country. Hence, the only practicable plan has been to dam up the courses of streams and ravines in the hills. As nearly all Bengal is comparatively low and level, this method is not applicable there, hence the terrible famines consequent in a comparatively small decrease of the average rain supply. But in the Deccan, in the Madras Presidency, and in Ceylon, the reservoir system has been carried to an extent astounding to the white man, who depends with tolerable certainty upon the rain, and who is accustomed to consider other races 
as universally indolent and improvident. In 14 districts of the Madras Presidency are nearly 53,000 irrigation reservoirs, four-fifths of which are in regular operation. Their size may be estimated by the fact that the retaining dikes average half a mile in length. One ancient reservoir, now broken, has a dam 30 miles long, shutting in an artificial lake of 80 square miles. The Vernum tank covers 53 square miles, has a dam 12 miles long, and produces $55,000 per year. In Ceylon may be seen a gigantic dam of cemented stone 15 miles long, 100 feet wide at its base, and 40 feet wide at the top. The same plan is of late years being extensively operated in our western tracts for the reclaiming of extensive tracts otherwise not cultivatable. With these exceptions, no great use of the reservoir system has been made in this country. Every sawmill, gristmill, or factory in our land usually has its dam in an adjacent stream to ensure a fair supply of water, but none of these can be properly considered general precautions against drought. The only prominent public works of the sort are the Croton storage reservoirs by which New York is supplied with water. There are 18 reservoirs with a total capacity of 14,000 millions of gallons. China has a great canal irrigation system, which is, perhaps, safer in some respects than the Hindu system, but which cannot command as large an increase in supply in time of drought, the water being drawn from the rivers, and thus having comparatively little fall. But the canals so thoroughly intersect the whole country as to serve as public highways, and in many sections there are no other roads. Doubtless, the methods of construction in India have been learned by long experience. Certain it is that for many years, at least, no serious trouble has ever arisen from defective retaining dikes. The public welfare is so intimately connected with these pools that they are carefully inspected and repaired. The destruction of the system might, at any time, precipitate a terrible famine. Not having a similar condition of things to contend with, the average American is not concerned about the few dams scattered about the land not one in a score of which would cause any serious loss if it were to break, and even were such death traps scattered over every county, it is doubtful if a race who would crouch behind a Mississippi levee and refuse flight till the last moment could ever be brought to a proper realization of the danger or their culpable negligence. The American is in a hurry, and so if speed be obtained, trains may wreck, vessels collide, or boilers burst, and the coroner's jury will obligingly render a verdict of nobody to blame. Since he also wants things at the bottom market price, he encourages the production of countless unsafe buildings, dams, and similar structures, merely because they are cheap. The most terrible lesson ever given to cheap dam builders in the history of our country is one which, with the reader's indulgence, we shall endeavor to narrate. In southwest central Pennsylvania, among the foothills of the Alleghenies, lies the peaceful and picturesque valley of the little Conemaugh. Here, in 1889, within a stretch of a dozen miles, lay five industrious and thriving towns, South Fork, Mineral Point, Conemaugh, Woodvale, and Johnstone. The last of these, embracing as it did, Cambria and Conemaugh Borough, was a city of 30,000 people. The population of South Fork was 2,000, Mineral Point had 800, Conemach and Woodvale, about 2,500 each. The total population of the valley within the distance named could not have been far from 38,000. Johnstown was the center of interest as a population. Thither came on May 30th, Decoration Day, people from Altoona, Hollidaysburg, Somerset, Latrobe, Ebensburg, and Wilmore, and from the four other towns already mentioned. There was a great concourse a long and impressive procession of soldiers and secret orders, with bands of music, flags, regalia, banners, bunting, and devices. With solemn pomp the cemetery was visited, and flowers were strewn on the graves of the patriotic dead. This sad but pleasing duty ended, the procession turned again toward the city, and entering the opera house listened to an eloquent oration. It was a day of more than ordinary interest and elation for Johnstone. The city stood happily and unsuspecting on the very brink of an awful doom. During the day the sky had been overcast, and there were occasional light showers. At nightfall the clouds lowered more heavily, and seemed to descend near to the earth. At nine o'clock there was a gentle rain. At eleven a tremendous downpour, which continued with little interruption during the remainder of the night. 
it seemed as if the windows of heaven had been opened. The site of Johnstown is at the junction of Stony Creek with the Little Conemo. Before eight o'clock in the morning of the 31st of May, both streams were bank full. As the day advanced, the lower parts of the town were inundated. By eleven o'clock there was a depth of five feet at the corner of Main and Market Streets, and at the Cambria Iron Company's store. Still higher, the waters rose, in the houses most exposed, carpets were removed from the floors, and pianos and organs were lifted on chairs and tables. Soon, the two angry streams were mingling their waters in the business center of the town. Both streams had been as high before, but never both at the same time. Some thought the Cambria Iron Company, which had narrowed the channel below the stone bridge, was responsible, and should be required to widen it again, and so make a free exit for the waters. By two o'clock the water was two to ten feet deep, all over the city proper, and the people had retired to their houses. There was inconvenience and cessation of business, but no one apprehended serious danger. They surveyed the providence of God without fear, little thinking of the destruction that, swifter than the avalanche, would presently come through the heedlessness or greed of man. Twelve miles up the river, eastward, and at an elevation of 450 feet above the city, lay Conemaugh Lake, this was an artificial reservoir, covering 400 or perhaps 450 acres of land, and having an average depth of 35 feet. Across the south fork of the Conemaugh, about two miles above its junction with the main stream, had been built a dam, 62 feet high in the center and 850 feet long. The valley, narrow at the dam, widened above to an extensive basin. Proposed in 1836 and authorized three years later, this reservoir had been finally constructed in 1852 as a feeder to the Pennsylvania Canal 14 miles below. A culvert at the bottom of the dam contained fine iron discharge pipes, each two feet in diameter, which could be opened at low water, thus sending the contents of the reservoir to the canal at Johnstown. In 1857, the Pennsylvania Railroad Company, having bought the canal, abandoned it, and the reservoir was thenceforth disused. In July 1862, the culvert beneath it gave way, owing to some imperfection of the foundation. The depth of the water in the reservoir was, at that time, not greater than 40 feet, hardly more than half its actual capacity. The breach widened to a chasm, and the water of the reservoir was discharged with the exception of about 8 feet at the bottom. But so slow was the process, owing to the substantial character of the dam and the resistance it presented, that little harm resulted. From 1862 to 1880, the reservoir was empty, and the property containing something more than 500 acres was a waste. In 1875, it was bought by Congressman John Riley, and was by him, four years later, transferred to the South Fork Fishing and Hunting Club. This was an association of three gentlemen, suggested and organized by Colonel B. F. Ruff, a successful railroad and tunnel contractor. All these parties had ceased from membership in the club prior to the great disaster. The original dam, constructed with care and solidity, had involved an expenditure of $240,000. It was built in regular layers and solidly rammed, and when finished was higher in the middle than at the ends, having a spillway cut through the rock in the side of the hill. The cost of reconstruction was no more than $17,000. No engineer, good or bad, had charge of the work. The material used was, for the most part, not more substantial than shale and earth and straw. The pipes at the bottom were permanently closed, and as the dam advanced, the water was discharged through a broad flume over the top. It was at first intended to raise the new dam to a height of no more than 40 feet, but it was presently discovered that to cut down the spillway through rock would cost more than to construct the dam to the original elevation. This was accordingly done, though not perfectly, as the dam was two or three feet lower than the old one and had, besides, a sag in the middle a fatal mistake, if once the water should begin to flow over the crest. Another mistake was the obstruction of the spillway with an iron grating placed to retain the fish, without taking the precaution at the same time to enlarge the passage. This would have been expensive, and here, as in the construction of the dam, it is apparent that economy was consulted. The sum of the mistakes made in the summer of 1880, and which culminated in the disaster of 1889, were, according to the report of a corps of engineers, who made a careful survey, the lowering of the crest, the dishing or central sag of the crest, the closing of the bottom culvert, and the obstruction of the spillway. 
the people of the towns below had often discussed the possible rupture of the dam but they scarcely feared it had it not been built by men who understood their business and might not these be trusted as men trust their lives to the doctor and their souls to the priest had it not resisted the flood of june 1887 the highest ever known and why then should it yield to any other it is certain that in the towns below some were not thinking of the reservoir at all while in case it should give way few had formed the remotest conception of the possible disaster on the very day of the awful calamity when the streets and sidewalks of johnstown were already under water a leading citizen to the question how much higher do you think the water will rise if the reservoir should burst answered quietly about two feet and we have not heard that any ventured to correct the estimate unsuspecting souls were they and yet wholly like other men those long resident by the volcano had ceased to fear its fires familiarity even with danger breeds contempt the evil which still delays we fondly believe will never come and as to the consequences if those who build dams know so little why should simple townsmen be expected to know more had they gauged that reservoir and did they know that up there in the mountains were six hundred and forty millions of cubic feet of water enough to make a veritable niagara for more than half an hour ready to rush down upon them had they calculated the awful energy of twenty millions of tons of water falling four hundred and fifty feet in a progress of a dozen miles and this progress down a pent-up valley in some places not more than three hundred feet in width had they considered that the flow of a mountain of water sixty feet high at starting must be far more rapid on the top than at the bottom that the base entangled among obstructions and overspreading them would furnish to the water above an inclined plane smooth as glass along which it would shoot with the speed of an arrow to fall over the edge of the retarded water beneath and furnish in its turn a ready passage for the water above and behind that in consequence of this law the flood would come not by a gradual rise giving time for escape but like a rolling mountain to smite with the impact of a falling asteroid and crush in an instant everything in its way had they reflected that such a body of water would outrun the swiftest paul revere who might mount steed to fly with the warning to the towns below that to the doomed the first announcement of danger would be the stroke of the destroyer that to the living there would be absolutely no more time for flight than to the sinner of preparation for judgment after gabriel shall have blown his trumpet it is safe to say that few if any had even remotely conceived the possibilities in the case men learn by experience and even from experience they fail to learn for the lesson of today is forgotten tomorrow and human heedlessness is perpetual the crest of the dam stood four or five feet above the spillway towards noon of the thirty-first persons on the watch saw the water of the reservoir rising at the rate of a foot an hour meanwhile a rumor had spread that the dam was leaking and this attracted other observers some declared that jets of water were leaping from the lower side to a distance of thirty feet somewhere about half past two o'clock water began to run over the top the structure was then evidently doomed for though rip-wrapped with stone on both sides no rampart of earth could long withstand the abrasion of a torrent running over its crest and down its lower face a south fork pastor reached the spot at ten minutes before three a foot of water was then running over the dam a few minutes later a break was made large enough to admit the passage of a train of cars then presently the whole thing dissolved almost instantly like a phantom a breach was made four hundred and twenty nine feet wide clean down to the bottom and with the noise of seven thunders and a tread that shook the hills like a young earthquake out rushed a mountain of water tree-top high at such a sight the awed spectator could only gasp god have mercy on the people in the vale below rushing onward a mile in three minutes or as some have claimed twice or thrice as fast in an instant down went a mill two houses and some barns up went an iron bridge tossed like a thing of straw and a moment later the flood was at south fork two trains a passenger and a freight detained by a washout further up the road were standing at the station warned by the awful roar the passenger train sprang out just in time to save the lives of the people on board the engineer of the freight seeing it impossible to move with his heavy train unhitched the locomotive opened the throttle valve and with the firemen flew for life the seething mountain leaped on the train and dragged it away regardless of two brakemen who surrendered their lives 
the village of south fork standing in the angle above the junction of the two streams and on high ground was comparatively unharmed though two lives and considerable property were destroyed on rushed the river down a valley having from the lake to johnstown an average grade of more than thirty feet in a mile a mile and a quarter below south fork the river strikes at right angles a projecting cliff the baffled stream makes a detour of two miles and returns almost to itself having accomplished an absolute advance of no more than seventy-five feet a railroad cut no longer than this quits the river above then regains and crosses it by a viaduct below the railroad bend at the upper end of the cut is twenty feet above the stream while at the lower end it is seventy here the torrent divided part of it twenty feet deep and forty feet above the river bed flowing through the cut the other part following the channel around when this latter portion returning struck the cliff at the lower end of the cut the water rose to the enormous height of one hundred and twenty-five feet from this point the monster towering to heaven and like a wild beast dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly and ravening for prey sprang upon mineral point a little more than a mile below the town was instantly wiped out forty houses being swept away and sixteen persons drowned the rest doubtless were saved by clinging to the wreck or warned by the ominous roar they had fled to the neighboring hills the methodist church lifted from its foundation and tossing in the torrent solemnly and for the last time tolled its bell as if recognizing the end of its days and usefulness and continued to toll until its burial was accomplished beneath the waters two miles and a half below mineral point the flood encountered another bend of the river with a cut and viaduct in all respects similar to that which had been described here again was enacted the grand and terrific scene which took place above then from this augmented height the torrent swept down upon east combe and franklin a mile below these villages standing on the opposite side of the river constituted the first of that series of boroughs known by the name of johnstown an engineer backing up the road and pulling at the nose of his locomotive a train of freight cars had proceeded a third of a mile above conma here the roar of the coming flood broke upon his ears and looking up the river he saw the descending avalanche instantly reversing his engine and drawing the throttle his whistle all the while shrieking a wild alarm he pushed at utmost speed the obstructing cars back to the yard of the pennsylvania road then leaping from his engine and leaving his whistle still to sound its warning he ran to his house near by and with his family escaped to the hill just as the rolling torrent dashed its billows at his feet three passenger trains and one freight had been standing on the side tracks some hours detained by the washout already mentioned the passengers were reading writing conversing worrying walking up and down the tracks in the rain or watching the driftwood and the constantly rising river but conscious of no danger something was said about a reservoir somewhere up the road which might burst and come down upon them but they gave the matter no second thought twice was one of the trains compelled to move as the water undermined the track and caused it to fall into the river once they were startled by the crash of a bridge which yielded to the rushing waters and was swept away it was near the hour of four in the afternoon and they were still wearily waiting suddenly they were startled by the long shrill shriek close to their ears of engineer hess's whistle and looking out of the windows up the river they saw an enormous mass of wreckage roots trees and driftwood borne aloft on the back of the torrent and rushing toward them with one impulse the most of the passengers leaped from the trains and fled for their lives those in the first train had to run round or creep under the second in order to reach the town and thence the hill between the trains and the town there was a ditch ten feet wide and five and a half feet deep filled with water into this many plunged nine women and girls together a gentleman who had leaped across tarried a moment to give a helping hand and all were rescued save one an aged woman she was apparently dazed for refusing the proffered hand she said i will go this way and walked toward the maddened waters and was lost the rest fled amain to the rising ground near by with the raging torrent not ten feet behind them gaining the hill they turned to behold a grand and awful scene the crashing tumbling buildings lifted from their foundations and hurled against each other the shrieks and cries and screams of agonizing despairing dying men and women and all comma going down in the fierce river the round house sprang from its seat like a toy tossed from a giant's hand and more than thirty great locomotives were rolled along like so many pebbles all the trains were carried away 
In some of the cars the passengers could yet be seen, while on the top of one car, loosened from the rest, were two men struggling desperately to keep their hold as it rolled from side to side. The whole four trains drifted down about five hundred feet, when they were stopped in a singular manner. Some inexplicable movement of the water lifted the head of one train and threw it across that of the other. Engines from the roundhouse were rolled down and piled against these. A mass of trees and drift were added, and the whole four trains, with the exception of two or three cars, were arrested and anchored in the midst of the flood. But, though the whistle was a warning, and the hills were a refuge to the people of East Conemaugh, the lives of twenty-four were lost, while of the passengers on the trains, twenty-six are known to have perished. One family was carried down in their house, which held together till it drifted against the steep hillside some distance below, where it was arrested long enough for them to make their escape. Two sisters, clinging to driftwood, were being swept past the woolen mill in Woodvale when a rope was thrown to them and they were saved. One man was carried on a drifting log clear through Johnstown and over into Kernville to find deliverance at the end of a wild three miles ride. Another, overtaken at the fairgrounds, climbed on the ticket shed and thence upon a telephone pole. This being quickly broken down by the impact of some solid body, he mounted a passing log and dashed ahead all the way to the stone bridge, a distance of more than two miles. Here he took hold of some wreckage, and by the backwater was carried to Main Street, near the Presbyterian Church, whence he worked his way to final safety. A quarter of a mile below East Conemaugh was the town of Woodvale. The story of its calamity has few details, since all its five thousand inhabitants were either drowned or engaged in a mad struggle for their lives. Every one of its eight hundred houses was lifted in a minute. Not one remained. Nothing but parts of the walls of the large woolen and flour mills. To the hills forty or sixty rods distant, not many succeeded in escaping. Relatively but few attempted it, for when the whistles sounded the alarm, the hills were too distant and the flood was too near. Such as fled were overtaken by the raging waters, and, to make the destruction doubly sure, a freight train was standing between them and the hill and this at the supreme moment began to move. Thus many perished when there was but a step between them and deliverance. The houses were mostly frames, and the people were commonly swept away with their shattered dwellings. We know there were thousands of wonderful escapes, the recital of which would fill a bulky volume, but more than one-third of the total population were quickly counted with the dead. Laden with corpses and debris gathered from five towns, with cars and trees, and all the nameless accumulation from a valley twelve miles long, the torrent now swept down on Conemaugh Borough. This in turn was quickly swept away, though more of the inhabitants succeeded in escaping to the hills. At the lower end of the borough were the Gautier Mills, a part of the great Cambria Iron Company's plant. These occupied perhaps ten or twelve acres of ground. When the flood struck them with their hundreds of fierce fires, there were thunderous explosions that shook the hills, and the whole seemed to rise up at once and slide forward on the slanting flood. One or two experiences from this part of the town must suffice for hundreds more. One lady drifted far down across the seventh ward and lay all night among the wreckage, within easy reach of seven dead persons, while the luxuriant hair of a dead woman drifted frequently across her face, half buried beneath the water. A wealthy German lady, a prominent member of the Lutheran Church, said, my son Henry and his wife, my son Charles and my son-in-law were all drowned. My pastor and his wife and four nice little children were lost. There is not one brick of our good big church left on top of another, and here is the key which alone remains. I think my heart must break from overmuch sorrow. A few days later she sank into the grave. End of chapter 16